Hi, Shane with Shane Plays here. I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, in this video, or a lot of it actually, it's the main point of this video, about uh, running chapter one of um, Out of the Abyss, D&D Adventure set in the Underdark, the Rage of Demons storyline. Um, you'll notice the video is black and white. I don't know, I'm just kind of playing around. Maybe that'll that'll fit the mood because it's a little a little scary, a little, uh, little ooey, spooky. Um, you know, the Underdark is, is kind of crazy. So just kind of playing around filters on my camera. I may keep doing this. I may not. I don't know. But for this video, it's black and white. Um, so what this video will be is I started running out of the abyss with my group earlier this week. Um, you know, we're a little bit behind the curve. A lot of other people have already been playing it. But it, it took us quite a while to get to the starter set um, or finish the starter set. I play at a game store once a week, two hours once a week on Tuesday night, so it took a while. Um, looking forward to digging into Out of the Abyss and keep going with it. One of these days, we'll, I'm sure we'll do Curse of Strahd, um, but this this adventure goes through 15 levels, so it's it's going to take, um, yeah, characters level 1 through 15. So, and I told the guys and gals, I said, we're going to be in this for a while, that's what you want to do, and, and they said that's what they want to do. But anyway, uh, th this video is, is, is not a review or anything about of the abyss. It's just basically I'm going to make a series of videos of my thoughts and notes of running it, uh, and maybe it'll help you, and maybe it won't, and maybe if you're watching, you can offer tips for future sessions or something. So um, anyway, the the first chapter of Out of the Abyss finds you your party that is um, in in uh, prisoners of the drow. You're you're straight up. You're captured. You're in the drow. Uh, uh, not camp, it's a stronghold, for, not a fortress, kind of a post. You're in some slave pens with some other NPCs. And, you know, you're in the Underdark, which is scary enough of its own, but now you're prisoners of the drow. And some people say dro, I say drow. I think I've said drow since way back when, I don't, I don't know. Um, back in the 80s, probably. But, uh, and they're, and they're, not, not, they're not a nice race, uh, you know, you're, you're basically there to be sold as, as slaves or to be sent to Menzo Berenzen as a sacrifice. So you're you're there with some other non-player characters who are also um, captured um, from within the Underdark. Um, and even though you were captured above ground, that's how I set it up. They were they were traveling as a group to go join an adventurer's guild, just getting to know each other. And they were they were ambushed by the drow and woke up this way chained and shackled and all that stuff so um, you know just some just some notes on this um, it was very important to me personally uh, and the book stresses this um, in chapter one it's, I think it's called escape is the name of the chapter I you know did, fighting your way out of this situation unless you just were incredibly clever and got incredibly great dice rolls is not going to happen um, there's I think something like 19 drow, including a high priestess of Loth. There's five elite drow warriors in the mix. Uh, there's a lot of quaggiths, which are basically underdark Bigfoot kind of things. Fighting your way out is not going to happen. It's just, it's not. I mean, like I said, you could you could maybe be somehow have a scenario where, you know, they, they corner one or two drow and, 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 you know, gang up on them and then escape. But to, but to just fight their way through the outpost... I think it's called Velkenveer. <laughs> I don't see how it can happen. And the book kind of stresses that too. I mean, you know, the, the Drow Elite Warriors on their own, I think, are CR5, Challenge Rating 5. You know, you've got, and I, you, you could start anywhere from first to third level. I've started never one at first level. Um, and then, you know, you've got, you've got a Drow Priestess of Loth. You have another Drow Priestess. You have you know, rank and file drow, you got quaggas, it's just not going to happen. Now you may be, like I said, you may be able to fight one or two and on your way out, but you're not going to storm the stronghold. Uh, this is, these are um, all pretty, a lot of people are going to be playing a first level character. That's how I did it with my group. And, you know, they, they have no equipment. That's another thing that, you know, I even told my, my players, I said, don't worry about your equipment because I, I had them all create um, brand new characters. I said, don't worry about your equipment. You know, I kind of gave him a heads up on that because I didn't want them to spend all this time on their equipment and then it's just taken from them. I know that would be very frustrating. Now, if they if they get clever or brave and kind of explore 
the stronghold a little bit on their way out, I'll let them find some stuff. In fact, uh, you know, I'd like for the wizard to find their um, spell book. And there was one of the NPC, or not NPCs, one of the player characters was like, oh, you know, I've got this trinket that's very important to my backstory. And I said, well, you know, did did you hear me last week when I said don't don't worry about equipment because you're going to lose it? And he said, yeah, but, you know, it's my backstory. So I'm going to try to work with him on that. Um, I don't want to be a complete jerk, um, you know, if, if he put time into his backstory. So, but at the same time, I'm not going to let it magically fall out of the sky into his hands, right? Because, I mean, I was very fair on the front end and, and said, you know, don't worry about your equipment. So we'll see how it happens. It's up to the dungeon master, of course. Like I said, I don't want to be a complete jerk, but um, at the same time, I, I read... There was a post out there I read, I think it was from Sly Flourish, uh, talking about running out of the abyss, and he said, you know, it's really kind of almost survival horror, um, and and I kind of like that. I mean, I don't want I don't want this ominous uh, feeling the whole time we're playing it, but I do want that kind of, you know, that survival horror, we're always on the run, just barely making it kind of kind of feeling. So, uh, you know, that's that's one thing that. Um, that you know you want to think about is is how are you going to handle equipment and all that and the, and the book you know it intros they're they're basically in their underwear when when they're in the slave pen so and and a cool little feature of the game is that you roll to see how many days they've been there and then depending on that they roll to see what items they found they could find anything from a flint shard that could be used to as a dagger to a iron pipe bar that can be used as a club little gemstone that's worth something maybe a gold coin uh, one guy got a tarantula or, or a spider so they get these little items um that's that's kind of like the classic prison movie you know where they've squirreled this stuff away hoping they can use it uh but the but the way the outpost is set up they're pretty much under constant scrutiny and in addition to the guards that are watching their um get you know the door to their cell there's a there's a hanging stalactite that's part of the outpost that's been hollowed out and it's a guard tower so i mean you know and they're constantly being watched from there so it's you know it's like in the classic prison movies or whatever you have the guard tower and the guys with the machine guns it's like that and in fact i i purposefully uh kind of gave it this concentration camp kind of nazi vibe that to, to, to kind of stress to them how how dire their situation is I mean, it's really bad you know this isn't well we're just going to flex our muscles and you know let, let freedom and then fight their way out i mean that's you know i guess you could do that as a dm and that's fine if that's your choice as a dm but it really kind of goes against the the tone and and atmosphere and scenario that the, the designers intended so uh what I did was, and another thing that, that's kind of a challenge for me, you know, I, ru I run this game on behalf of a store. It's Imagine Games in Sherwood, Arkansas. I think Imagine Games and Hobbies is the full uh, um, name of the store. But anyway, I try to be very flexible in allowing people in um, and making sure everybody has a good time. So I think we had 10 or 11 players the other night. And... You know, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, but I don't want to turn anybody away. And we actually have another group running in the store at the same time. So we've already split off. Um, and, you know, so since it's on behalf of the store, I, I try to be pretty flexible in making Now, if it was, if I was running in my home and living room, there's no way I would allow 10 players because it's just a lot. But at the store, you know, the rule is, and I emphasize this every session, is like the main thing is everybody gets to have fun and everybody gets to shine. So we're going to make this work. And we do. Uh, you know, depending on the players, it may not, but we've been able to make this work. We've had, uh, when we were playing the starter set and we uh, went through Thunder Tree with the Green Dragon at, at one or two sessions, we had 10 people and we made it work. So uh, shout out to my players if any of you are happen to be watching this. Um, but anyway, so what I did, and the reason I, I, I stated that, I've got a lot of players to work with and to, to kind of, you know, work in. And that fluctuates. Some week we may have five people, some week we may have 10. I've got four or five guys and gals that are consistent so you know they're they're my core players and then i have other people that kind of come in and out but i said all that to say that I, I intentionally my first session of the game for out of the abyss i intentionally wanted to spend the first two hours introducing the concept the scenario i even spent a little time on you know narrating the the trip they were on when they got ambushed by the drown 
spent a lot of time on introducing the NPCs, the fellow slaves and prisoners, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Spent a lot of talking about the situation they were in, kind of reaffirming how how bad the situation was, and, and kind of reintroducing the the drow over and over to give them a sense of of, of the of the setup and the you know what, what they're dealing with. I had and. I even after the campaign or after the session, I was like, hey, man, I'm, you know, that's not a normal thing I do. But I was trying to, you know, set a tone here. A couple of the characters, you know, kind of lipped off and did really kind of um, foolhardy things to the drow captors, especially the high priestess of Loth. And I had them beaten unconscious. Uh, and, you know, I, I said, are you going to take it or do you want to roll initiative? And they were like, oh, I'll take it. So it got the point across that. You know, you're in a really bad situation here. You're not just going to shout amazing things and beat down these drow and, and run off into the sunset like a hero at this moment. So, uh, you know, I, I really spent a lot of time on that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you got you to gotta get them on the setup. They're up. They're 100 feet up in the air in this outpost uh, that's that's platforms and stalactites that have been hollowed out and, and all these things. And then underneath it, there's webs that have been spun by these giant, oh, you got giant spiders that are working for the drow. So, you know, and then underneath that's a hundred feet down and there's this pool of water that the, sometimes they go down into and empty their chamber pots in and just really stressing the scenario they were in. And I intentionally, I know had two hours, you know, we try to go 6.30 to 8.30, sometimes we'll go 8.45 ish or whatever. But I intentionally wanted to go two hours, do role play, introduce the scenario and then at the very end of the evening, um, I wanted to introduce a twist and then say, see you next week. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, and it worked out really well. I didn't have to force it. And I, and I was able to think, okay, I got this many players. I got these many, I got to introduce the scenario. I've got to introduce all these NPCs, um, all, all this stuff. And, and, and about the time that their minds are going to start clicking on, okay, what can we do? And, and how do we escape? I wanted, like I said, to throw a, to throw a twist and end on a cliffhanger. And that's what I was able to do. So that cliffhanger was, the, the book suggests three different ways of escaping, of staging the escape. One is, you know, they're, they're, they're finding these little items around, you know, that they, they roll for. And then also as they're, they go out for work details and maybe you can let them find some more items and stuff like that and kind of start planning your escape like you know one of these classic prison break movies um, another one is one of the drow uh, high ranking or kind of a higher ranking male drow has been kind of lost favor with the high priestess um, and a younger drow has taken his place and he's upset about that so he wants to help he doesn't care if the characters make it out or not but he wants to help them break out um, to embarrass them and then the third uh, thing the book suggests is because part of Out of the Abyss, there's a demon uh, uh, uprising kind of going on in, in the Abyss uh, or in the Underdark. And so there's this kind of surprise um, uh, demon attack that, that can kind of come in and, and swoop out on things. Uh, and it, the whole outpost goes into an uproar and your characters can escape in the middle of that. So... What I did was, at the, and I already knew in advance I wanted to do this, at the end of the two hours, uh, once I had really reinforced a, a, a practically hopeless situation, I, at the very end, I had that drow, I think his name is Jorlin, um, he, he identified one of the characters, he came in and he spoke directly to one of the characters and he said, if I could help you escape, would you do it? And then I said, I closed the book and I said, I'll see you guys next week. And I ended there to, to give them now that, you know, after I've hammered in, you guys are, there's no way you can escape. It's awful. You're in all kinds of trouble. Uh, if you even just speak up, you get beaten unconscious, all this stuff. Then I gave them a ray of hope. And what I'm probably going to do is as they're in their jailbreak uh, with Jorlin helping them, like leaving the door unlocked or whatever, then the demons are going to attack. I, I read another blog post, somebody did that, and I like that idea. I'm not going to have them fighting a bunch of demons because they're not prepared, but it's, it'll be very exciting and dramatic and, and, and that sort of thing. So I'm almost positive that's what I'm going to do, but I've got another week to think about it. But they're definitely 
if they take Jorlin up on his offer, that's how they're going to get out of the um, slave pen anyway. So um, anyway, sorry, I got distracted. My um, Even though my webcam's going on all that, my computer tried to uh, blank out on me because I guess there had many activity for a few minutes. All right, so uh, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, the NPCs. There's several NPCs that are really important to not only this chapter of the um, game out of the abyss, the campaign, but possibly for future sessions and maybe the whole thing. You know, you, they could build relationships here that uh, that they stay with for the whole um, for the whole campaign up through level 15 or whatever. So what I did is is I made this handout and and th this is one thing that I've, I, I kind of don't like the way out of the abyss is set up it refers to um, you know you got drow priestesses and you got elite drow and you got this and you got that and it doesn't give the stat blocks and the but you have to go get the dungeon master's guide and open it up okay I, I can deal with that but it's introducing a ton of NPCs and they didn't give you a handout of any kind whatsoever you know not even anything to just print out out of the book but there is a website I found called uh, thethirdgames.com, and they have a, uh, a post called Out of the Abyss Jailbreak NPCs, and they've got this excellent PDF that they took the NPCs from the book and their artwork, and they not only did you get the artwork and the names, but they statted them out for you. So I'm very impressed with that. It was very helpful. What I did is I took this, uh, hand out and using a photocopier I ended up making this okay and I handed this out to the players that has the portraits and the race the gender race and name of the character for example Shushar the Awakened is a male Kuatoa uh, and Stool is a Mykonid Sprout and Stool is uh, you know was probably the most popular NPC he's a very young uh, Mykonid mushroom based um uh, sentient being uh just really friendly to anybody's friendly to him and he just wants to get home he's very scared so he was he was probably the most popular npc but these are these the some are very friendly some are very surly some are mad crazy uh this drow here has spores in his head that are driving him crazy this guy here uh what's his name again bupito seems extremely friendly but he's actually convinced that he's like the reincarnation of a of a deity or something and if he gets a chance he's going to sacrifice somebody uh these two here topsy and turvy are um they're twin deep gnomes but they're also were rats um this quaggeth here prince dorindel uh it's a quaggeth but it's gone insane and it thinks that it's a an elf prince named dorindel who has a curse on it that has turned into a quaggeth um and so the, and one of the things without the abyss that you'll find out is to go into it and, and the players will find out madness is spreading throughout the um, the, uh, the Underdark because Demogorgon has been released, the Prince of Demons or whatever, Demon Lords, is, is uh, Lord of the, whatever he is, he's nasty. He's rampaging through like Godzilla and, and spreading, or madness is just spreading. So some of these NPCs are like, hey, if we get out of here, we got to go back to my home of whatever. And they think it's a safe haven, but in reality, madness is spreading everywhere. So... I can't recommend enough going to the third eye games and printing this out. Okay. And then making a little handout for yourself. I can't, I can't stress that enough. Um, it, it was extremely helpful because there's so much information you're throwing at your, at your players. So, and these NPCs are really important to the story. Now the book suggests, you know, you have these little stat blocks. The book suggests you can actually, you know, hand out the NPCs and let the players play them as well. There's nothing wrong with that. That's personally not how I wanted to do it. I want, I want these because some of these NPCs are going to have plot twists and and stuff like that. So I, I wanted the players to be the players and the NPCs to be the NPCs. That's how I chose to do it. Um, and and two because some of these NPCs for dramatic purposes, I, I may have killed uh, or I may have them do stuff uh, to advance the story. Uh, I may have them killed off abruptly to emphasize the danger of the situation. Like when the de if I have the demons attacked, one of these MP one or two of these NPCs are going down. That sort of that sort of thing. So that was my personal choice. Um, but I, I've talked to DMs 
and players that did it other ways and they enjoyed playing the NPC. So I'm not saying that's bad. That's just not how I did it. So uh, one funny little story here. Um, Prince Darendel, the Quaggoth, uh, one, one of my players, uh, it, it's interesting, you know, you kind of get to know people over time. I've got, I've got this younger guy. I'm going to guess he's 11, 12, maybe 13, but I'm thinking he's, he might even be 10, 10 or 11. He's in my group. Dad brings him every week. Um, and he just comes in and plays and he's been so quiet forever. And then here recently he's been talking more and, 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 uh, just being more outspoken with his characters. Well, the other night, um, he said, he said, um, can I ask, he always, he'll go, can I, can I ask a question? I say, yeah. And he's like, um, can, can I give Prince Darendel um, a wedgie because my, character's lifelong dream has always been to give a prince a wedgie and i didn't it just stopped everything we all had a big laugh i was like i where do i go with that so what we did was uh, and my son has just walked in what we did was um hey buddy you, tap, you want to come up here and say hi to everybody so what we did was um i, I, I said you can do whatever you want man it's a role-playing game but you know this is a quaggoth uh, and they're basically, uh, I, the way I described it, I said, take a wampa. Ah! Ha, ah, you like that? From um, Empire Strikes Back, that thing in the ice cave that had Luke hanging upside down. I said, take that and kind of reduce it maybe by half. Uh, and then somebody else said, it's basically an, under, an, an underdark Bigfoot. And I thought that was a great way to put it. And then somebody else pulled out a kind of a, a big gorilla figurine and set it down to kind of get the guy that, the, and he was like, oh, okay, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Hey, buddy. But it was, it was, it was, it was really, it was funny. It, it was a great tension breaker because, hey, buddy, we can't, we can't be doing, it. they're trying to listen. I know you don't understand, but people are going to be trying to listen to this. Um, so it was a great tension breaker because it was a very heavy introduction. Uh, and I normally don't spend so much time on, on so much exposition and all that. Um, but Out of the Abyss starts a little bit differently than most other adventures. Uh, and another thing I normally don't do is follow up on my players, multiple players, and say, hey, guys, that's a little different. Did you have fun? I want to make sure. Because I can usually tell by people's reactions if they're having fun or not. Um, you got my wizard's staff there, buddy? All right. So he's got my, my hiking stick, a.k.a. wizard's uh, staff. But, but this time I did because it was so different and, you know, and I can usually tell by people's reaction if they're having fun or not. But this time I wanted to make sure. So I followed up with some players and everybody I talked to said, yeah, that was really fun. And, you know, I can, this is going to be cool. So I feel good about that because I, I was worried that I was, I was so trying to emphasize the direness of the situation that it would seep through and just kind of be a, a buzzkill and nobody would have fun. Um, so that, you know, one, they did have fun, which is good. I had, a, you know, a couple of people, um, younger girl that plays like, oh, it's great. We got to do all that role play because uh, past several sessions had been basically the dungeon crawl at the end of the starter set. So she was really happy to just do pure role play. We did have one combat where Raunt, the male orc, uh, who's the surly one of the bunch, if there's going to be a fight in the slave pens, it's probably going to involve Raunt. And sure enough, had that it was very quick combat. Um, and, you know, was, uh, you know, one player character got into a fight with an NPC and then five other players are trying to jump in, which is kind of crazy. So I just had the drow run in and stop it. Uh, but, the, but they did manage to knock out the, the orc, Raunt, um, who's an NPC before then. But anyway, the point is they had a good time. So I'm, I'm relieved that I was able to strike a good balance between you guys are in a really bad situation and but yet they had fun. And then, you know, the guy, hey, can I give Prince Darendel a wedgie? Because my dream is to give Prince Darendel a wedgie or a prince a wedgie. It was a great tension breaker. So that, that kind of helped lighten the mood and everything. So overall, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, those, these are my, my tips on this are, um, you know, I, I, you know, I even told the guys and gals, I said, you know, it doesn't seem to you that fighting your way out in a full-on frontal assault is the way to go here. Because I don't want half the party to die, you know, in the first session. Because if you attack all these Drow and Quaggoth, somebody's going to die. Um, 
you know, now if they'd come up with a very clever, you know, ruse or something like that, that's fine. I wouldn't have disallowed it by any means. Uh, but I was trying to get them thinking, how do we get out of here without just, you know, rolling initiative and attacking everybody? And another thing, like, you know, even the 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 slave pen they're in has an anti-magic field in it. So, I mean, you can't, even count, you can't do anything. It's a very, very, very dire situation. So, and they're just waiting to get picked up by the... Um, the caravan to be taken to Menzo Bronzen, so they're either going to be slaves or sacrifices to Loth. So, like I said, it's a it's a dire situation. Uh, but but you know, I really kind of stressed, you know, let's find a you need to find a way out of here. Uh, and you really do. You can't just sit on your laurels, right? You can't. You've got to do something. And I had the NPCs, all the NPCs, no matter if they were friendly or not. Everyone, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. So you know, really focused on that. But that's how I played the first chapter um when they get out uh you know they can go multiple directions so that's going to see it's going to be interesting to see which which way they end up going um you know when the when the npcs and all that um uh you know which ones survive and which one they recommend so after that you know it could go multiple different ways but uh but the way you know it's set up in a very specific type of scenario so Anyway, welcome your thoughts, comments, whatever on this video. You know, if uh, you say, hey, yeah, well, we did it this way and it was really cool or, or you know, or hey, did this come up or, you know, whatever. I'd be happy to read and respond to those comments. Um, and I, I hope to make this a, you know, kind of a weekly ongoing series to get my thoughts on how I'm running um, the campaign. So thanks so much for watching uh, and listening. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. Maybe leave a comment that helps me out tremendously. Thank you so much for watching Shane Plays.